So ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We are entering into this, two, this second uh, session, which is about unlocking deal flow for subnational portfolio of low carbon and climate resilient infrastructure projects. And we are going to speak and to present and to launch the first subnational climate fund. Just to make a small introduction, we are going to concretize you what has been discussed this morning in particular, but in general, what is all COP about. And as you know that we are facing, I would say, some difficulties in general to go beyond plan, to implement projects at the field level in the hand of subnational authorities. And it is where we can serve the people who deserve to access basic services, such as waste, such as energy, energy efficiency, transport, etc. So the whole idea is how you can make this happen. And you need partnership. You need an alliance of different stakeholders who are really going to take together the challenge of make it happen. From identification of projects coming from subnational authorities, you need to structure those projects so that you got the proper data for which you are going to have the private sector to analyze those data and to make the feasibility studies for those projects to be bankable. And then you need the money to invest in, and you need finance vehicle to be able to invest in small-scale projects. Small-scale project is for us between five to 50 million US dollars, where development banks have difficulties to deal with those small scale. They are at ease with one million plus, but our target is very this gray market which doesn't exist really yet. And this is what we are going to do, to unlock it with all the stakeholders which are involved in a single partnership aiming at the same thing to deliver project on the field. So I have the honor to introduce our president of R20, Magnus Bertson, who will make us a three, five minutes introductory remarks. Then we will ask Mr. Graber on behalf Patricia Espinoza on behalf of the UN system to tell us to have the encouragement in order to go forward. And she has been very keen to introduce us to GFC for the first fund that we are going to launch for Africa. And then we are going to have Gino Van Begin, who is the Secretary General of ICLEI, who is, I would say, for me, the best network of cities on the field where they have day-to-day -day relation with the citizens, and they have been able to brought us a portfolio of 400 projects where we are going to work now to make them happen, at least a selection of them. So please, I would like Magnus to have the first words. And we have a timekeeper, where is Jens? And he's going to be very sharp about timekeeping because we have a lot of presentation to do, and they will do one or two minutes branding what is the role in this value chain. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, yes, I get shorter time all the, uh, <laughs> all the time, so I'll be quite quick. I'm Magnus Bernsson, I'm the new president of the R20. I'm also president of the Assembly of European Regions. In my home region, I'm the president of the Regional Council of Västergötaland in Sweden. And yes, we qualified to the World Cup in football yesterday, so I'm very happy about that. Uh, R20 is facilitating uh, the, the role of connecting the dots between uh, subnational uh, authorities uh, who drive uh, sustainable uh, policy and decide on on uh, green uh, infrastructure pro projects and um, sustainable technology holders which are having a clean tech solution with its services and also investors uh, public or private willing to invest in new um, sustainable market economy so R20 has during the last years conducted a different uh, such uh, infrastructure projects at subnational level. Uh, in Kita Mali, uh, a, a solar uh, project, and in Oran, in uh, Algeria, a waste management uh, project, and in, in Delta State of Nigeria, a biogas uh, project, and in Mato Grosso in Brazil, in, in Brazil uh, lead street light uh, projects. And thanks to the successes of these, we have uh, 
um, made it possible to create uh, value chains that we will hear more about you know, during this event. And, and why is this is important? Uh, it's important because this is the first time a, a network of sub-national um, authorities is controlling the whole uh, value chain. And th this is by identifying a, a portfolio of projects, but also uh, structuring uh, the required data by uh, developing banks under a standard format, uh, thanks to the source um, platform that we will hear more about also. And then also we are conducting feasibility studies to assure bankability of these pro projects, uh, thanks to uh, project preparation facilities that will be presented to you today. And uh, furthermore, it's important for, for the first time to develop partnership with specialized uh, impact uh, fund manager, namely Blue Orchard, which have uh, agreed to structure uh, uh, decided funds for subnational investing, bankable infrastructure uh, of projects with high environmental and social impacts. So, uh, at this, uh, uh, which is entire process will be SDG and uh, climate uh, certified thanks to the partners with Gold Standard and uh, My Climate. And this event will showcase how R20 uh, is uh, starting with the Subnational uh, Climate Fund of Africa of, of, uh, and uh, blend the finance me mechanism allowed attracting of private source investments and how we will be able to um, starting next year to replicate to other regions of the world, Europe, islands, Obor, ASEAN. And we are very lucky here today that the op uh, to have the opening of, of, of the speech with um, opening speech by um, James uh, Graben, uh, director from, from UNFCCC, and uh, also that the event will be closed by Mr. Yong Lee, director from General Unido. So uh, we're happy with the co cooperation also with the UN uh, agency so, and all the other partners. So I won't take the floor anymore, so thank you very much and welcome to this event. Thank you, Magnus, to have given, I would say, the, the landscape of the next uh, hour and 15 minutes. I will ask Mr. James Grabber to come here. I know you have just come in on spot, so it's a difficult exercise for you. So thank you very much to have uh, uh, replaced at the last minute Mrs. Espinoza, who has been retained for the negotiation. So you are the Director of Sustainable Development Mechanisms Lead, Global Climate Action at UNFCCC. Thank you very much. Well, thank, uh, thank you, and uh, although this may have been last minute, this is a topic that I am working on as the lead for the Global Climate Action. Me and my team are probably working with many of you on, on the, the, the finance element and the importance of, of, of this topic, so it's, it's not foreign, foreign to me. However, um, let me first express my deep gratitude um, to R20 and all the organizers for inviting you uh, in climate change to be part of this important uh, meeting here today. Um, as you've heard, I'm here on behalf of our Executive Secretary, Patricia Espinoza, um, who regrets, un unfortunately, uh, she's tied up in a, a number of uh, different activities you can, you can probably imagine. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, never before uh, in the 23 years of our uh, conferences that we've been doing um, have we met this, been here with such urgency. Um, the extreme weather events that we have been experiencing globally are affecting every continent and our planet. Um, entirely. Lives and livelihoods have been lost. People are still suffering. Communities and economies are still rebuilding. Our Secretary General, um, when he saw the damage in, in the Caribbean um, firsthand, he said we have a collective responsibility to stop this suicidal development. Now we have the political will. We have 169 nations who have ratified the Paris Agreement, and the agreement has entered into force in a record time. Um, this is a strong political will we are seeing to act on climate change. There is also an unprecedented alignment in, in the principles of the agreement from the business and the investor communities. In many sectors, capital allocated today determines the future of our global economy. 
Showing that finance is flowing in the right direction and at the speed and scale required is critical to drive the ambition for both climate action and sustainable development. Even if modest, we have positive momentum to build upon. Um, heightened by recent extreme events in both developed and developing countries, increased focus is being placed on climate risk insurance to meet the needs of the vulnerable for sudden and slow onset impacts of climate change and those disasters. Capital markets are innovating, building on the leadership of development finance institutions. The total value of green bonds by mid-2017 uh, stands at uh, $220 billion U.S. dollars. This has grown exponentially since 2013. Institutional investors with over $20 trillion in assets are recognizing the climate risk and opportunities and have committed to climate action. Financial authorities are responding to climate risk and opportunities highlighted by the work of the Financial Stability Board, central banks, securities, and insurance regulators. However, more is needed to achieve the Paris Agreement's ambition and to decarbonize the global economy. More investment in reallocating the global capital flows towards low carbon and resilient growth is required. More inclusion to ensure that flows reach the countries and communities with the greatest needs to reduce the vulnerability and sustain growth, doubling flows to developing countries by 2020. More integration to make the long-term consequences of climate change and wider sustainability factors a routine part of the financial decision-making process. More innovation to enable green deal flow, particularly growing domestic capital markets access to risk sharing for access to international capital markets. More climate-aligned pricing to force the factoring of climate effects into the individual level decisions as no single company has a significant effect on climate, yet collectively there is a huge effect if we do this. More sustainable infrastructure to provide for climate resilience to tap the private financial system's endless capacity for innovation and speed of action. Ladies and gentlemen, acting on climate change is not just the right thing to do, it is also the smart thing to do. It is crucial whether we roll up our sleeves here today, we work, we undertake as part of the implementation and as part of the worldwide push for sustainable development. I am confident that this group gathered here today can take that step, build that bridge, and as part of the worldwide push for sustainable development. I'm, um, excuse me, between the global political will and the local action that makes a real difference in the lives of people. This is what we have to come together to do. All I ask is that you share your progress with the world. Help every nation and every community learn from your experience and transform their own reality. Together, we can and must make sure that every community in every country can be climate resilient. As our executive secretary says, we no longer have the luxury of time. We have to act now. Doing so depends on the policies that incentivize building resilience at the community level. It depends on a steady stream of actionable projects in the pipeline, and it depends on the political will. Your presence here today, and indeed at COP23, shows that cities, regions, investors see the action in the Paris Agreement as a way to deliver a better life to communities and the people who live there. This is an amazing opportunity of political will and support for what has been agreed by governments. Now is the moment to capitalize on this momentum, to go for the conversations about what to do and doing what needs to be done. Now is the moment to put the projects in the pipeline that transform the infrastructure and invest in the resilient communities that are better able to withstand the impacts of the coming years. It is a moment of great opportunity. Above all else, we must work together to seize this opportunity, to accelerate the action and transform the growth and development that is needed. This is how uh, we deliver a future for every woman and man and child on our planet today and hand a better world over in the gen generations that will come. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very encouraging words. And I will ask uh, Gino to tell us, as from subnational authorities, you were able to identify those projects in order to go to the next step, which is from action to transaction. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, it is really an honor and a pleasure for me to be here today. Um, it's a big 
and very important moment um, where we are launching here the Subnational Climate Fund from R20. First of all, I would like to give my gratitude and, and, and thank the organizers, Jens, Nielsen, thank you very much. Uh, Christoph, thank you very much for inviting us here. But I would also like to give my regards to the president of R20, Mr. Benson. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning I came out from another uh, session uh, where the discussion was about indeed tapping into the financial opportunities and the difficulties uh, which arise for local and regional governments. Um, it was said in that session that uh, towards 2030, we would need 90 trillion US dollars um, to actually finance the urban transition. And it was also identified that there are numerous barriers to actually tap into those financial um, opportunities. First of all, institutional barriers, but also market barriers. It was said that there is lack of upfront public capital, a lack of, and maybe inertia of institutional capacities. Um, from a market perspective, return profiles, risk profiles, and imperfect information are continuing to be a barrier to actually move on in investing and therefore accompanying urban transition. It is therefore a very great moment that R20 has been since Paris been able to work and cooperate with numerous other financial institutions to actually now bring together this very first fund, which as it was said by the president, fully under the value chain, fully under control of subnational uh, governments. It is very much needed. It is, I think, a game changer. It will help to change the speak between the needs of local and regional governments and the needs of financial institutions. We have been, as ICLE, very, very pleased to be part of that process. We have been using a mechanism that we have set up, which we call the TAP, Transformative Action Plan Program, to identify from local and regional governments good projects, projects that have a transformative character, that truly are inclusive, that truly have a sustainability perspective. And we are very proud to have been able to put this forward to our colleagues um, of our 20 and our colleagues within this fund. Christoph, we stand by to our 20 to deliver on those projects. You said more than 400 projects have been uh, provided to you. Our cities in Africa are ready. No more talk. They want these to be seen realized and therefore start building a sustainable Africa. Thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we go to the action. So I will ask maybe our three panelists to join by their seats and to ask the new panel, the next one, which is about structuring projects and project preparation. So I may ask Christophe Dossard to come, CEO of Sustainable Infrastructure Foundation, Gilles Péqueux, the Director of International Development at Aegis, Christian Plus, the Head of Hydropower Generation Alpic, Nicolas Cretenant, Director Africa for BG Consulting Engineers, and Ari Vera, Head of Global Public and Government Affairs, Philip Lighting. And while they are coming on stage, I will just introduce you this torch that you are seeing. This is a symbol of like the Olympic Games, the Olympic torch, which is going from one Olympic city to another one. And we have Moroccan colleagues, uh, their organization is called MIPAI, uh, where they have started this process at Paris COP21, and they have brought this torch to the Moroccan uh, head of state, so the his, uh, Royal Highness of uh, Morocco, who has chair of the COP22 as hold uh, this torch for one year in uh, Marrakesh, and it has been given at the beginning of COP22 to the Prime Minister of uh, Fiji. And this torch came uh, on a very carbon neutral basis. They came through electric 
car from Paris last year to Marrakech, and then this year they came from Marrakech to Bonn in a fleet of electric cars. And they went through Geneva where two, well, 10 days ago on the United Nations Plaza, you had welcome a fleet of 100 electric cars to celebrate the Saharan ship as it happened. And this is what the talk is, uh, and you will see it next year uh, in uh, Poland. So may I introduce now our uh, delegates, and you will have two minutes to just say what within uh, your different organization you are doing to structure and to prepare those projects that has been identified through ICLEI for Africa and others, FMDV, there's been a number of organizations who has been helping on that, and how you are going where you are to help us make those projects being bankable at the end of the day so that we can give that to the financiers. So Christophe Dossard, in two minutes, can you summarize how these projects are being structured thanks to your source platform? You have a microphone? Yes, I do. Yeah. And uh, I'm gonna ask, yes, it works. Um, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank also the organizer, thanks to R20 and thanks to the World Climate. Um, basically, what we have developed, I work with all the multilateral development banks, the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, Development Bank of South and Africa, which is a DFI, Development Financing Institutions, European Bank for Construction and Development, Inter-American Development Bank, Islamic Development Bank, World Bank Group, including IFC and others. Why am I sharing that with you is because we have been working with them for the past seven years on creating a software that would enable governments to better prepare projects. Now, what does make a project well prepared? We didn't do anything within the team. What we did basically is to ask, to ask contractors, investors, lenders, and advisors what they would like to see when they evaluate a project at the due diligence process. And it's not only about uh, sustainability, it's not only about economic, it's also about legal, financial, technical, environmental, and social questions. And we have received 5,500 comments. Uh, actually, Aegis was uh, one of them, and we have had 80 companies that have participated to it. And instead of having those questions on a paper, on an Excel document, we decided to put that on a platform, on a software, because we are in the dig digital age, we're in the 21st century. So it was making sense. And uh, since then, we have basically launched it just a year ago, so you might not have heard about it. And it's available for free to governments. The MDBs are developing and funding it. They are starting to use it. I was just yesterday in Jordan with IFC, Europe, uh, uh, Asia, and Europe, Asia, oh no, they're gonna like it, and MENA. MENA region, Middle East and North Africa. So basically how it works is that we have those governments and MDBs that are using it going through a series of checklists. It's like a protocol to make sure that the project is well prepared. It's a common language. And that is actually something that is missing. And we have a lot of different initiatives that are popping up. And it's actually, I've, I was in a panel uh, two days ago in Bonn, and here uh, they were saying that there are too many initiatives and it creates competition in terms of project preparation. But actually, when we look at the state today, we need competition. And it's actually a benefit for the government because they can choose and create competition, which will create better offers and better prices. So if we have more, sometimes less is more. But if with the SNCF, it's an opportunity to have more opportunities. At subnational level, there's also the program of EIB called Felicity that is also financing projects at subnational level. The MDBs are also going more and more to subnational level. So it's in the hands of the government to also market and choose and use a standard that the MDBs have created. And the R20 will also use source. Why? Because it's going to create. One minute, Christophe Lest. Thanks. Are you sure? No, I'm kidding. So basically, the, uh, what, is, what is interesting is that by creating a common language, what it does is that the private sector will know what they are looking at. So I will summarize and fin uh, finish the speech with one thing. Caisse de dépôt de placement du Québec is working with us. It's a pension fund in Quebec. A pension fund will never bid for a project, at least in the case of CDPQ. What they are doing is that when they receive projects, proposals from their clients, they need to evaluate how the project was prepared. They have limited capital. We always say financing is not a problem. Yes, globally. But each institution has a limited capital. So what they have to do is to choose the best project. And whatever is the best project, well prepared, going through the ESG, 
SDGs, Climate Paris Agreement, technical questions. What is the traffic forecast? How many cars do you have? What is your population rate? How fast is it growing? Those questions are not necessarily taken into account by governments. So the point is that if you provide something that provides the same language, consistency, more transparency, we're going to have what we are looking for is more projects that are well prepared. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe. Gilles Peque, we are uh, building together and we have signed at COP21 uh, in Paris uh, the project waste facilitator and how we can benefit from the experience on a natural basis from uh, AGIS to develop those feasibility studies. Thank Gilles, you, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, AGIS is the largest engineering French group of, uh, of infrastructure. Uh, we are 14,000. We work in 100 countries, and our shareholder is Caisse des Dépôts and Consignation, CDC, a public institution, with, as well uh, with us in the project. What is very important to mention, we are not only engineer, engineering, we are engineering and operator. I would like to mention three key of success in such challenging project, which are solid waste and waste to energy that we will develop jointly with Air20. The first one is upstream for downstream. We cannot work on such project if we don't work on the total and global value chain, including the financing of the value chain from upstream to downstream. This is a key, first key factor of success. The second one is local content. No way uh, if we don't involve the local content. I said we are present in 100 countries, it means we are not exporting, we are with our local staff in this country, and this is a key issue. Statement, that's very simple. Transition uh, challenge are due to demographic issue, to the need of economic growth in the cities. The challenge and transition are in the cities. It's where we focused. Our, and in the mid-sized cities, local community. But the second statement, it's a matter of fact, we have an issue of financing in the cities, lack of subsidies, and as mentioned, <laughs> as introduction, Christophe, with CapEx from five, 5 million to 75 million, the Bank of Development does not finance. That we have an issue which is a bit strange. The challenge is in the cities, and we don't have the subsidies to finance project and transition the cities. Therefore, what do we do? We do that, we build up the value chain from the very beginning. And it's where start the value, the value chain start by a good project. And in good project, we mentioned source. One minute. Yes. And this is the story of the chicken and the eggs. Good bankability good technicality in the project, meaning financing of the study. This is what we did and we are doing on our value chain. We are investing at the upstream part, the waste project facilitation, where we put 1.5 million together, all together, to finance 10 studies, out of which we are going to initiate feasibility, which will allow us to get the financing for the downstream part, upstream, for downstream on the global value chain. This is where we expect, we, with good project, thanks to source as well, we start two projects today in Mali and in Ivory Coast, and I have finished. Thank you, Christophe. <laughs> Thank you, so we are going now to the next one. Sorry, I don't know how to stop that. So uh, now we are going to go to the second uh, project facility on energy, and we are going to ask Nicolas Cretenon, who is a, a director at BG, which is, I would say, a small Aegis in Switzerland, but with a Swiss touch. Nicolas, please. Thank you, Christophe. Good morning to everyone. So we'll address the same problematic that Aegis does with R20 on waste on the energy, renewable energy and energy efficiency the challenge of upstream financing for studies. How can we bring identified projects 
to bankability so that investors can invest into it. So we will address pre-feasibility and feasibility studies for all renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, addressing projects from one megawatt to a few dozens to be in the capex that Christoph and uh, both Christoph mentioned. We will also target mini-grid approach, so projects that are not necessarily the big, large, where there's the geopolitical issues and grid issues, but neither the small ones, but the one where there is a productive end use of electricity, which allows also economic growth, especially in Africa, to create all these required jobs, which also require electricity at the base. We're going to create this energy project facilitator officially in exactly one month, together with our 20 and together with Alpic, a Swiss and European utility. Ourselves, we are a Swiss engineering firm working in all infrastructure fields with about 600 people and 60 years old. And within the energy, we work only in renewable energy, so we don't have a past history, which gives us a credibility that we always believed in renewable energy from the beginning. And we're already working now on a pipeline of several projects, hydro, biomass, solar, that we will bring to bankability. So I give the word to Alpic to introduce the role of and utility within the energy project facilitator. Richard Plus, please. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm representing Alpic. That's uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, utilities in Switzerland with a large uh, European footprint. And uh, our contribution to, to this uh, facilitator uh, organization will be that we have the operational experience of all types of renewables. We, we operate uh, large hydropower plants from 1,000 megawatts to uh, installations of, uh, of rooftop solar grids. We also have the operational experience of wind parks. Uh, so we, we are ready for all types of solutions we could implement in, in Europe or uh, uh, in the target areas like uh, Africa. You may think, why is a, a utility like us uh, uh, joining up with Air20 and uh, uh, a leading engineering company as BG? And what we are observing in Europe is, a, is a, uh, we call it sometimes the 3D challenges. We have a challenge of decarbonization, which uh, is the main topic uh, here 30 today. Seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah, okay. Decarbonization, uh, we have uh, decentralization and digitalization. And we, these three challenges, the, in Europe we can uh, leapfrog with projects in, in developing countries where you have a greenfield approach. And that, this is our interest to implement such solution directly uh, elsewhere. And we think with this partnership we have excellent competencies to do so. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm okay, sorry sir. to be rude to stop you, but we have a long list. Ari Rivera, we don't need to present you. Everyone knows you here. So what is your input within this value chain on LED street lighting? Yeah, so we are, we are a partner on the project in Casper's facility. The PIF for solar LED street lighting. Um, and what is important to note is that we don't have a lot of time, not only here, but certainly not uh, until 2050 when we need to be a decarbonized society. My two sons will even be a few years younger then than I am today. So this is a marathon. It's a marathon and converting the market uh, towards 2050. And what we see uh, as a need for projects is we need to create replicable and scalable projects. And for that, I see how the PIF, the Project Investment Facility, a bit as the training program and the warming up with which we create uh, the technical and the financial project design capabilities that will allow us to replicate and scale uh, because all the new infrastructure that will be created globally will have to leapfrog. And for urban infrastructure and roads, uh, that is with solar LED street lighting. So we're happy to work with, with Christophe, uh, but also with John Titmarsh and David Albertani from the R20 team and with the other partners in this uh, to make this happen. Thank you very much. So that was the panel on private expertise to help us, I would say, get the right information in order to go to the stage of bankability. So now we are going to turn to the next panel, which is about financing. Thank you very much. So I call on stage Patrick Shirley, who is the CEO of Blue Orchard, Martin Berg, who is the Investment Officer, Infrastructure Fund and Climate Action Equity, New Products, on special transaction of the European Investment Bank. Marion Velez is the CEO of Gold Standard, and she will tell you 
why it is important to have a procedure which can be certified on the SDGs requirement, on the Paris Agreement requirement, as well as Corey Constable, who uh, from a UNSDG uh, office will deliver also a, a message of uh, support for these uh, blending finance mechanisms. Where is Kerry? She was there, I saw her, but, so we are, we are going to start. So Patrick, can you tell us uh, from a fund manager perspective, you have been, uh, I would say, the, the leading uh, uh, impact investment uh, manager in microfinance. Uh, how, what is your recipe to make a blending finance mechanism which will be attracted, attractive to public and private investors? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, thanks very much for joining us here today. It's a great pleasure. Thanks to Christoph for, for having us, and thanks to all the organizers for doing a splendid job here, making us uh, feeling comfortable as well. Since Blue Orchard back in 2001 was initiated by the United Nations, we have uh, done almost uh, 2,000 per investments in uh, roughly 75 countries. Uh, all emerging markets. Uh, we've invested several billions of, uh, of US dollars in, in, in these markets. And uh, as of today, we are the manager of the largest microfinance fund in the world with uh, currently 1.2 billion US dollars. But uh, at the same time, we have also utilized this unique know-how and expertise and experience and that we have gained in these markets to developing into other asset classes including private equity as well as infrastructure. At the same time, we have also developed a tremendous expertise and experience in, in blended finance, meaning bringing together public investors and private investors to uh, invest alongside together to capitalize on each other's uh, motivations and scale up financing in uh, various, uh, various areas. We as Blue Orchard, we feel very honored to be part of uh, the Subnational Climate Fund. Uh, we believe it's a, it's a great initiative with uh, potential far beyond uh, the fund and uh, with, uh, with a huge multiplier effect uh, in, in, in that sense as, as well. The fund initiative as such is uh, somehow replicated in uh, or rooted in the what I call California model and vision of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to basically bring the success that he has had and California still is having in uh, fighting climate change to emerging markets. Now, in emerging markets, we certainly have a, a, bit, a bit different uh, starting point to, to, to work with. We've heard of some of the challenges. One is certainly uh, capacity at, uh, at, the, at the local level, but it's also the small projects that we are investing in, in the range of five to 50 million US dollars, which seems too small for many of the, the big actors out there. So it needs, to, uh, it needs to have a specialized approach, a dedicated approach for, for, for this initiative. So we have uh, thought about it uh, with, with R20, and I think what R20 has developed already uh, very impressively, in, in our view, is a, a complete value chain approach. So what we can do is really to cover everything from project origination, identification, training of local authorities, developing projects, bringing them to operations, uh, including performing due diligences, doing the risk assessment, provide the funding, and as well the entire MRV, meaning the, 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 the reporting and measurement of the results in financial terms, but as well in, in terms of uh, avoiding greenhouse gas emissions. Now, I'm closing off with a kind of a, a call to action, and uh, that's basically uh, maybe to, uh, to, to, to uh, base on uh, some words of Arnold Schwarzenegger, really let's talk more action, and now let's move from action to transaction, and let's start implementing projects together with the local authorities. Thank you, Patrick. So we have structured this first uh, fund of 350 uh, million, which we have started the roadshow, and we did start in Luxembourg with EIB. And uh, we were very impressed by the fact that you were welcoming this idea. And we, will, we have already started to discuss 
how we can structure, and you have helped us finalize this document that is going to be bring to you in order to see what kind of money you can put in. So can you please uh, uh, take a few words about what are your own perspective in investing in Dutch subnational infrastructure project, including waste, for which you know it is a challenge. Mm. What I came here to talk about is, is our engagement on the uh, on this subnational fund that uh, R20 and the Blue Orchard are putting putting together, and um, the reason why why we as a bank are, are interested in, in those type of opportunities is that. Uh, uh, we do have a focus on, 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 on climate action. 25% of, um, of our financing is uh, climate action related, and that comes roughly per year to, to 20 billion. So we're doing a lot. Um, uh, obviously, uh, being a financer of infrastructure in general, um, and, and, and having not only climate as a policy goal, also other projects have to be financed, but um, and I'll leave it here now. Um, yeah, we had we had long discussions about uh, about the fund. I think what we what we what we do like on initiatives like this is that when when different organisations come together to form an investment proposal that that achieves di different things. So in in this case here, our twenty forming forming. Um, a good relationship with the fund manager and coming something which takes both a lot of policy objectives and, and that's really what we are there to support of and at the same time comes really with a, with a business proposition because in the end that's what we need in order to tackle climate, uh, climate change. We cannot just continue doing publicly funded projects even if they are very nice. We have to engage the private sector. So here um, we, we have a proposal on the table. Um, Blue Orchard is, is known to the bank. They are uh, uh, um, experienced fund manager in the area of microfinance and, and I think what, uh, what we find attractive is this blending of both public and private finance. And, and really trying to reach um, the subnational level because obviously that, that is, is always a bit more challenging. Um, We've been now um, speaking for some time. I think we, we went through some of the different iterations of the, of the project proposal. We very much welcome a much more regional focus. We think that's much, much more comprehensive for, um, uh, for, for many investors. And then the other aspect we really uh, like to see and, and uh, we're a firm believer is that more and more of those proposals do not only take climate, um, uh, goals, but they also really address the SDGs, and I think that is that is one of the the interesting things we're seeing now more and more that we're seeing now and, and, and a little in, um, say convergence from pure climate uh, focused investment vehicles to to a much broader approach, and and that's obviously also needed as well. So I'm, I leave it here. Thank you, Martin, to have uh, been patient enough <laughs> and to have said your words. We, have, we are dealing the same way with other, uh, both multilateral and bilateral banks. But as you know, the finance is also about non disclosing everything. So you have accepted to be part here. So we appreciate that. But we are also uh, working with other banks, especially for this fund, including private uh, uh, investors. So, Kerry, it is you now to conclude, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, for, before I am a little bit uh, you know, stressed by what happened. <laughs> so uh, Marion uh, Verles, she's the CEO of Gold Standard. And what is also very innovative here in terms of uh, having a new stakeholder on board uh, on this kind, it is to make sure that this whole process is, I would say, both very transparent in terms of governance, in terms of impact, of what the projects are going to do respective to the SDGs in terms of the Paris Agreement. So the whole process will be verified, will be going in a way that at the end we can speak about certification for which the project coming out that will be financed, financed will be certifiable as such in order to have access to credit carbon or whatsoever. So Marion, can you in two or three minutes also summarize what we are starting to do. Sure. Thank you, Christophe. Um, just before I talk about our role in this, just taking a step back, if we're here today is because we know that climate action is not only necessary, but it's also desirable. Well-rounded climate interventions are going to deliver impacts far beyond climate impacts. They're going to create new jobs. They're going to sort of deliver better health, better food, uh, enable sort of better management of water, and so on and so forth. And if you have that in mind, and for also looking at 
the surge in new initiatives looking at financing climate action and financing the SDGs like climate bonds, green bonds, renewable energy certificates, it's, it's looking really good, but we also know that given the scale that is required from an impact perspective, given the, the scale in the impacts that we need to, to deliver, we would be sort of really, we would do well to ensure strong safeguards, strong governance, and also ensure that impacts has, are maximized. And um, this can really happen with robust processes, comparable standardized processes that maximize not only the climate impacts, but also all the sustainable development impacts that those interventions are having. At the gold standard, we've been um, looking to connect the climate and the sustainable development agenda for the last 15 years. And we launched recently this summer, our new standard, gold standard for the global goals that will make it not only possible to report on the climate and sustainable development impacts of interventions, but also to monetize some of those impacts. We are no longer organized in silos, looking at agriculture on one hand, energy on the other hand, sort of food or waste on the other hand. We have one platform that can certify a range of impacts across all interventions. And really what we want to do with R20 and Blue Orchard is to jointly develop an innovative certification pathway that will um, apply the gold standard for the global goals to the subnational climate fund and really define some of the provisional requirements that will ensure that the subnational climate fund process can be certified. And so that certification is not only a way to avoid some of the activism that we've seen here, because our safeguards are known for being some of the stringent out there, but it's also a way to ensure that at the portfolio level, they can be very credible and robust reporting not only against the objective of the Paris Agreement, but also against the sustainable development agenda. And it's also a way to ensure that at the investment level, each and every investment activity can plug into the environmental markets that are the most relevant to them. And so we could plug into renewable energy certificate market, carbon markets, unlock resource-based payments for some of the positive externalities that are being delivered by those programs. So really these are some of the value adds that the certification um, will bring. And, and just to close, I think th the spirit of the collaboration is also to realize that every dollar counts, every investment counts, and really the pioneering work that we're doing together, we hope can inspire others and become a new benchmark for climate and sustainable development impact reporting and, and quantification. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So you see how innovative we are. <laughs> Please, Marion, I know uh, we have been working some long time ago. We were uh, colleagues at the UN. So can you give this, I would say, closing remarks of uh, this uh, uh, panel in terms of innovating financing for subnational? Thank you, Christophe. And, um, <laughs> greetings, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, as I, uh, my name is Carrie Constable. I work um, in the Secretary General's office on cities and climate change. And um, what's, I'm really pleased to be here, as Christoph mentioned, we began working together on the importance of climate finance at the local level back in 2014 when the Secretary General at the time had a climate summit to mobilize action in advance of COP21. Um, and what's, what, what's very important to us, I mean, there are many things that were said today. One is, of course, the link between climate change and sustainable development. Um, that, and that's what's re very important and of interest to us about this fund is that there, it, there are so many co-benefits. The other thing that's very important is as much as we are, the world is mobilizing climate finance at the multilateral level, the national fund level, I mean the national development bank level, the financing is, is not reaching the most vulnerable. It's not reaching the cities. Um, we really need to find more innovative ways of decentralizing financing. And we also need to empower the regions that are the most vulnerable, particularly in Africa, which is one of the most urbanizing regions of the world, to access financing and quickly. Um, so that we will need enabling environments, cities will need credit ratings, and we will need more and more of these facilities that work across the value chain from concept to action. 
Um, so I'm really grateful to be here to be part of the um, inception of this. Um, and I'd really like to encourage more of this kind of work. I mean, what we really need to see is a mobilization and really cross-partner collaboration. And I know that we say that a lot at the UN, and oftentimes it doesn't mean much until you actually see something like this in action. Um, so what we're doing here as the Secretary General's climate change team is we are discussing with many partners what we can do at the subnational level and how the Secretary General's Climate Change Summit in 2019 can mobilize more action like this. So um, please, if, uh, if you have any ideas, we are here to, to talk with partners, to talk with experts, and, and hear your ideas for 2019 and going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. So you are making the ex excellent introduction because this first is opening a number of others, and you will hear the next five minutes, I would say, others to scale up, to replicate. And what we are looking here as an NGO, as a non-profit organization, it is how can this new economy, this new way of doing in this emerging market, trying to de-risk as maximum for investors, is that in the next two, 10 years is going to be business as usual. As microfinance is, and when Blue Orchard started 15 years ago, it was brand new. Now it's business as usual. So what we're doing now, it is opening the doors to be hopefully business as usual in the next 10 years. So thank you very much, panelists. And we'll ask the last set of panelists to come. <clears throat> so may we have Philippe Jean-Pierre, who is the chief cabinet of the president of uh, Région Réunion France. Magnus Bertson, you have seen him, but he's also the president of the Assembly of European Region. Nico Barito is a special envoy for president of Seychelles for the ASEAN. He's also uh, our director uh, in uh, Indonesia. And uh, Armand Yost, who is the president of the R20 Foundation, permitting an NGO to deal with the finance sector. So again, I'm going to ask the four of you in, I would say in one minute because we have lost time, but we can be efficient for the good wealth of the planet and for the good wealth of its uh, citizen. So please, uh, uh, Philippe Jean-Pierre, one minute to summarize what are your, our ideas to scale up and to replicate this Africa SNCF to other parts of the world, namely the islands. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, and, uh, it is a great pleasure to, uh, to, to, to express myself uh, on behalf of the President Robert, as you said, and uh, to join the SNCF uh, project, uh, not to introduce myself, but to introduce uh, who we are. We are just a small islands, Reunion Islands, located in the uh, Indian Ocean. And uh, we are considered as, uh, as sentinel islands, but this role is not, has not to be heard and to be known from a techno technological point of view, but also uh, from a, a, a smart strategy point of view. We have to go beyond our frontier. We have to go beyond technological uh, uh, tools. And uh, we, we have to imagine how we can go uh, beyond for our area. And uh, thanks to Mr. Ambassador to be, to, to be here to join us. And um, we are working together for, for a long time, but it was only maybe uh, when we belong to, to R20, it was only declaration, Christophe. And when we match a few months ago uh, about the uh, SNCF project, we immediately decided to confirm our presence for this project in this area because we think that uh, for Reunion Islands, we have to play this major role together in Indian Ocean with other islands uh, to provide solutions, smart solutions to match. We are in an area of the planet where projects are, are there, but finance missed. And so we have to match, to gather our efforts, to gather all the tools we have, and to jump on the SNCF project uh, to try to resolve this match. Regions, region islands can be, they can play these roles. And so, so already for the next few weeks, we are jumping and start to work with you. And uh, thanks, Magnus. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you very much for your encouraging words as well. Nico, thank you so much. We have just came from uh, Vietnam uh, in order to announce us how we can also here work together in the ASEAN area. And I know you have good news for us. Thanks, Christophe. 
Excellency, Director General of UNIDO and uh, President of R20, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me to be here. Well, I mean, uh, as an envoy of President of Seychelles, I don't think I have to say a lot about climate action in Seychelles. Everyone is know how committed Seychelles is to climate actions and how Seychelles have come up with the provocation of ideas of blue economy. I mean, uh, we work closely with the reunion, all these small island states, I mean, uh, the alliance of small island states, small island development states are working closely with us on this uh, blue economy initiative. Today, I'm going to stress about my role as director Asia Pacific for R20, just to make sure that the groups, the distinguished guests doesn't look R20 only as a group belonging to Europe and Africa, because actually R20 have a lot of things going on in Asia and Pacific. We are happy to say that ever since we started our center in Asia Pacific headquarters in Indonesia, we already have a biofuel project in Indonesia, which is another initiative which we do with a local government, a provincial government. And then uh, we do last year have a project with the city of Solo, which belongs to the hometown of President Jokowi, where we launch a waste to uh, energy project uh, with a capacity of not too small, about 50 megawatts. And uh, last week, uh, I am in uh, Hanoi in Vietnam, and uh, we end up uh, entering into a partnership with uh, the People's Committee of Hanoi, which is actually at the level of the governor of uh, Hanoi, a deal of uh, 150 megawatt of power plant. Uh, the city has about 6,000 uh, tons, so we can do more than that. So we are talking about big countries, big places. In APEC, everyone is talking about globalizations and the impact of globalizations, the gap, what's going to happen. So it is a call of initiative. It is not only a call of because of climate action, but the growth of economy, the growth of industry in Asia, in that part of the world, both at national and local government level, have drive shortages of power. So by the shortages call of power, yeah, everyone are immediately looking for solution. What kind of solutions? It is, of course, new and renewable energy. So big industry have been working closely with us. I was also the Secretary General of Forum of Small Medium Economy Africa ASEAN, which we focus very strongly on small medium industry. So we can see how the role of public-private partnership, national government, and local government Happy to announce that when R20 Indonesia started, you know that Chris, right? 416 local government is our board members. So we have substantial needs and we have substantial commitments, not only asking for the funding support, but also the local government have funding. And we are really committed to deliver the subnational climate funds. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nico. Last words from uh, subnational authorities, uh, Magnus in your quality of president of the Assembly of European Region. Also, we are working on establishing such a similar fund for European subnational. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, another of my hats is that I'm actually born on a little island, so I feel very close to my fellow uh, friends here in the panel. <laughs> uh, but representing uh, regions of, of Europe, uh, I would say this is something that is true for all, all regional and local authorities, that we take care about ordinary people's everyday problems and we are trying to facilitate a good life for our citizens. That's very close on the ground. And when it comes to uh, European regions, I, I would say that we have had these different systems of financing our, our um, sustainable projects, but we know that that the, the budget for the EU will be, of course, affected by the Brexit situation and, and other things. So that's not so much EU projects that we will get financed through in, in the future. We will get guarantees for loans and things like that. So we need to start to rethink the way that we are uh, organizing our, our projects so, and, and make them bankable. And this is something we, we are trying to, to do now. And there are new, very good um, uh, systems in the European Union, uh, especially the Juncker Plan or the European, sustainable, uh, the European Strategic Investment uh, Plan that that's definitely also focus on, on the sustainable investments. And this is something that we are, uh, are uh, having a good 
discussion and cooperation with different EU commissioners right now, and we definitely want to, uh, and we are on the merge of starting also a sub-national climate fund for, for Europe, and we are, hopefully, uh, we could be able to present this uh, when we sit in, um, in next year for the COP24, to, to, uh, COP because we really need to make this happen. Uh, and uh, of course, everyone is afraid of what happens with, with um, when national states or federal states are not so committed uh, as we, uh, we know the American situation. But I was very encouraged yesterday when I heard uh, Governor Brown, the, the present go governor, uh, uh, Jerry, Brown, Jerry Brown from, from California, when he said, yeah, some people ask if America will not do their part on the, on the federal uh, level, does that mean that the others should also step, take a step down? And he said, no, that would be stupid. You need to do more. And I think this is something that we know from the regional side. We need to do our part, and I'm happy to do that from, from the European side also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magnus. And Armand Jost, you are the uh, president of the new R20 Foundation that Arnold Schwarzenegger announced uh, two days ago at uh, Bonn Zone. So you have, I would say, the synthesis to summarize us of what are your inspiration and what are the way forward for the next months to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank all of you that you came here. It's a great moment. I have to say that I met Christoph one half year ago. I have a background in finance, in industry, waste management, diplomacy, and also services. When we met together one half year ago through Geneva government, we immediately saw that Christoph is activist, I'm also activist. And I stay like that activist, standing up and just ovation to all of you all what you bring as interest and also your energy to make a better world. And here with Arnold Schwarzenegger, with the R20 Foundation, what is now building up is a new movement with a whole value chain. And this value chain is only possible if every, uh, every stakeholder will take his place. And the place is not only in project identification, not only in finance, but also on the ground to work with MRV and all the stakeholders of this project. And we are now at the stage that all together we are working close, and I really hope that we will succeed in the next year, that we can reach $1 billion Ne end of next year in the COP24. Thank you for all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Armand. Before uh, going, uh, giving the floor to Mr. Young Lee, Director General of UNIDO, I would like my colleague David Albertini uh, in one minute to tell you what's going to happen in five minutes where we are actually going to start. We have started already, so we are going to sign agreement with Côte d'Ivoire and Mali to make this process a real process. So can you just give us one minute about what's going to happen? And then I will ask Mr. Yongli to come, and I will ask our panelists to go back to their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christophe. So uh, again, from action to transaction, so let's start with action, and in five minutes we'll, uh, we'll have some action. So as Christophe said, we are going in the name of the Waste Project Facilitator that R20 and AG co-created to sign a number of LOI to initiate feasibility studies in three different uh, geography for municipal solid waste management. So the signature will take place in the little room close to the reception and you are all invited to join us. So we'll have a first signature in Mali for the Commune de of Bamako and we will sign with the Energic, represented today by its president, Mr. Yamin Seum, and the vice president, Mrs. Geneba Keita. I think, yes, they are here in the room. We will have a second signature uh, in Ivory Coast, and all the projects in Ivory Coast will be signed in witness of the national parliament 
here today represented by Mr. Famosa Koulibaly, the president of the Environmental Commission. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Both signature in Ivory Coast will also be witnessed by the National Association of Region of Ivory Coast, represented today by Mr. Lassina Diomande, the vice president of the association. <clears throat> Thank you. The first project we'll sign in Ivory Coast will be done in Yamoussoukro, signed with the district of Yamoussoukro, represented today by its governor, Mr. Auguste Tiam. <laughs> Thank you. The second project will be signed in Lojibua. It will be signed with Waste Treatment for Africa 21, a private company, represented by its president, Mr. Osne Yusek. The second agreement will be made in witness of the Council of Lojibua, represented by its president, Mr. Zapka. Zapka. Sorry. And maybe if you allow me just a last word, as we said, the most important is the impact. So before VP study, I just wanted to say a few words on the impact. Those three projects would totally treat around 400,000 tons annually of municipal solid waste. They would create around 500 sustainable jobs in those area, and altogether, they would improve the life condition and the health of three million inhabitants. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the signature in five minutes. Mr. Gen Director General, please, uh, the yeah. last words are yours. Thank, thank you, you very much. thank you, thank you, Christopher. Uh, Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, uh, it is a great honor and a priori uh, privilege to speak on behalf of United Nations Industrial Development Organization uh, at this uh, meaningful event uh, that has announced a very important and much needed subnational climate fund. Uh, the fund comes at a very timely manner since discussion with the COP23 focusing on the means of the implementation of Paris Agreement. This is a, an exciting time for all of us uh, as we come together to understand the, and identify how the fund will contribute to the sustainable infrastructure project uh, advancement and financing, most notably in Africa, uh, which uh, is a very promising continent with large movement of industrial development and the uh, uh, movement of the transformation happened in this region. I'm very happy just now I heard uh, a few projects uh, will be signed uh, very quickly right after this uh, event. Uh, African countries have witnessed and uh, will continue to experience remarkable economic growth in the coming years and the infrastructure and energy element of the economic growth based on the low carbon emission pathway represent an important cornerstone in achieving sustainable industrial development. Uh, a low carbon emission pathway of the economic growth is uh, subsequently crucial for the advancement of the sustainable development goals, SDG goals, and the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, UNIDO has been working in Africa for many years, actually 51 years, uh, without any stopping, uh, assisting areas of industry, infrastructure, and to create a sustainable livelihood through the regional investment programs, capacity building, and other national, subnational level projects. Cover wide range of area, agro, agro uh, industry, and uh, environment and energy. Uh, I'm glad that uh, recognition of cooperation at the sub-regional sub national uh, level is increasing, not only in Africa, but across the globe. Uh, I worked very closely before with ASEAN, which is a very important sub-regional uh, uh, re organization. Uh, we have projects implemented in the field that are good examples of how sustainable industrialization enables and empowers inclusive development while also tackling social economic factors from job creation 
to economic development, from the security concerns to the empowerment of women, youth. And going back to the relevance of subnational action in combating climate change, we can look at the case of the cities and rapid urbanization. Colleagues, I really would like to share with you one information. Increasing urbanization presents a challenge in our efforts to mitigate global greenhouse gas emission that towards adapting to the climate change. This will in turn see the emissions from both the energy and the industrial sector increase. We noted as cities currently account for 70% of the global greenhouse gas emission. Colleagues, friends, this is a very big challenge for all of us. Uh, they stand to play an important role in the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the move towards climate resilient infrastructure development needs to be prioritized in the urban areas and uh, with urban activities being the major uh, uh, causes of the uh, GH, uh, GHG emission. And in this regard, you need those annual events, uh, Bridge for Cities, Belt and Road Initiative. I really would like to share with you a little bit of piece of information, developing green economies for cities. Event uh, serves as an innovative platform for municipal uh, stakeholders to share and exchange ideas, success stories, and lessons learned from the achievement of inclusive, sustainable urban and industrial development in cities along the Belt Road and beyond. Uh, the second Bridge for City event, I really would like to uh, mention that uh, the total number of uh, city, 136 from the 67 countries, uh, numbers doubled uh, than the previ previous one, and a very uh, 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 proactive discussion and thought-provoking suggestions have been made by all the cities. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, the common target to have the city be sustainable, uh, environment, economic development, transformation, all included in the uh, agenda. The R20 is uh, already uh, promoting this uh, change at the subnational level, supporting government officials, policymakers, investors, academias, and engineers in the implementation of the green infrastructure project. UNIDO considers the G20, R20 is an integral partner for the promotion of inclusive, sustainable industrial development, which is our mandate. Uh, SDG Goal 9, at the uh, municipal level, it is my sincere hope that our two organizations will continue to work closely. Uh, and in the coming years, especially on the Bear Road Initiative to build a dedicated value chain on the project implementation and the financing for sustainable national, uh, sub-national government in these regions, including a dedicated subnational climate fund for Belt Road in, uh, uh, Initiative. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear a very fruitful discussion. I heard from the whole session, different panels uh, uh, among this uh, delighted delegates. I'm also pleased to see the new in initiative with a huge potentials very big potentials to spur uh, climate actions in the sub-national uh, sub level. I look forward to future cooperation between sub-national climate fund and the UNIDO in the promotion of our shared vision in the development. I listened very carefully. Uh, there's a very important message from all the panelists, from the audience, from the president, is that we start from the ideas and turn into actions and then turn into programs. Then finally leads us to the impacts, results to our countries, especially, I believe, in Africa. Thank you, thank you very much.